that we can come to him and just talk to him about anything and everything, just like we would talk to each other. <coughs> he loves us, you know? Um, and I guess, it's like I said, a quality conversation with God, you know? Time is so precious to us. We want to do everything that we want to do that we enjoy. That's just the human side of it. Well, guess what? God's a timekeeper. He's the one that knows how much time each and every one of us has. And he'd like for us to spend it with him. What do we do with our time? Are we good managers? You know, we, we manage our money. We space out when we have to go to work and what we have to do with that. But do we waste our time on worldly stuff? And like I said, only you can answer that. Well, how to remember what God said. Turn over to Exodus. And this scripture's on the bulletin board back there. Turn over to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to start in verse 1. When you get there, if you can, stand for the reading of the word. Exodus 20 and verse 1. Then in God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You can be seated. First, two talks about out of the house of bondage. Didn't God bring us out of the bondage of sin? I mean, we were all tied up in sin, and yet God brought us out. He offered us salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And then verse 3 says, Thou shalt not have, well, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Plain, simple, to the point. Don't put anything else before me. I'm to come first. I, and then, what does the verse say? The other verse say, he is a jealous God. You know, some of them had worshipped him. Some had strayed and quit worshipping him. They had other gods, the moon god, the sun god, the god of fertility, the god of love, and so on and so on. They worship just about anything and everything. And he's telling them, you better make me number one. So they worship something that they thought had power to give them what they wanted and to take care of them. Something that they believed in. And the dictionary talks about a god a person or thing of supreme value to a person. What do we hold in high esteem? A movie star? An athlete? Or a job? Or a house or car? Or a mate? Our kids or grandkids? Uh-oh, that one gets us because they're special. Well, now you're getting in my business. Well, not really, because God said nothing is supposed to come before him. And I'm not a sugarcoat kind of person. We don't make graven images, but who's our idol? You know, you know. I just love this one, or I just love that one. You, took, you watch this stuff sometimes on TV, or you'll see something on, on uh, Facebook. And someone's at a concert, and they're just boo-hooping and bawling and screaming and yelling, or even at a ball game, screaming and yelling. You go to church, and you hear a pin drop. Who are we worshiping? You know? Um, and I used to be bad about this. I love chocolate. I just love chocolate. 
we throw that word around just carelessly. I love this or I love that. We need to be loving God more than anything. That's where our love needs to be placed. Sometimes I wonder if we listen to, what, to ourselves and what we say. You know, back to verse 3. God wants to be first in our life. There's no way to change it or even to ignore it. He said, God said, and if God said, then that's a way it better be. He wants to be first. No, we pray, we go to church, we pay our tithes, but we better Let's put it this way. We come to church to worship God. But Brother John, you better be out of here by name because it's lunchtime. <laughs> now I'm worshiping God. Don't get me wrong. But I got my crock pot cooking at home. And, you know, my stomach's starting to grow. You, you, 12 o'clock, you cut it off. And it don't matter if the spirit's moving. You cut it off. We come to church with that attitude. You know, we do. Or, Brother Jason, now don't you preach over an hour on Sunday night because at 7 30 my TV movie starts and I gotta be home so I can watch it. Now I, I watch that every week. Now, brother, don't go past an hour. Because if you do, I might not get the first part and I won't know what happened to Elizabeth Wright or whatever. We come to church with that attitude. Is God first in that? I might tell you, if the Spirit's moving, I don't care how long I stay at church. Amen. Amen. Don't make me any difference. If my stomach growls, it won't hurt me to lose a meal. It won't hurt me to lose a few pounds. But we say we worship God and we put Him first and then we come to church with an attitude like that. I know a man, he's deceased now, different denomination, he sang in the choir at church. 12 o'clock, he took his robe off, folded it up, and put it on the pew up, and I'm, he's at the front of the church, put his gown robe on the pew, and he left. He said, after 12 o'clock, that's my time. Why? Well, to tell you this, every minute you've got is God's time. Amen. He's the one that gave it to you. Right. He's the one that's going to continue to give it to you until he's ready to call you home. <clears throat> so it's not our time. Every day we live is not our time. It's the time that God has given us. Do we put him first? Where is God in, in our lives? You know? And I'll be honest. I've been guilty. I've sat on that pew and thought the kids are headed for the house. I need to get out of here. I'm cooking for them today. And hopefully I'm not the only one that's been guilty. But like I've heard people say every lesson or every sermon has hit us first. You know, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. Where is God in that? You know, nothing, he said, nothing before me. Nothing. So, what God, I wonder what he thinks about us. You know, what God do we think the most about? God Jehovah? God, that new car I want to go wash, shine up. God, that fishing boat. God, that house we bought. You know, we spend so much time bragging about the stuff, material stuff that we have that we forget to mention that God's the one that gave it to us. And you can think, well, I worked for it. Yes, you did. And God gave you the breath and the opportunity and the strength to do that job. God gives us all sorts of things. Now I'm really going to get after us. What about our kids? Our mates? Our family? You know, when Pharaoh's heart was hardened, he wouldn't let the people go. What was the most important thing he lost? His son. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he was disobedient to God. What happened? His firstborn son died. And then you got Abraham and Isaac. God told Abraham to sacrifice a child that he loved more than anything other than God. And because his love for God was first, 
and his heart was in the right place. And he put God first, even at the expense of his son. God spared that child. So which category would we be in? Because, you know, God gives us everything, and God can take it away. He said he was a jealous God. He's not going to want us to put anything or anybody before him. By putting God first, I wonder, I wonder what our children see in us. Do they see us excited about coming to church this morning? Or do they see us dragging out of bed, bed saying, well, man, I wish I could have stayed in bed, but I got to go to church. I used to say, I got to go to church tonight. Got to go to church Sunday night. Got to go to church Tuesday night. No, you don't got to. You don't have to come to church. You don't have to. But it's going to help you keep saved if you do by gathering together. The Bible says don't forsake it for assembling yourselves together. You don't have to come. What do our children see in us? Do they see that we feel like we have to come? Or do they see us get excited and come expecting something from God because he's been so good to us through the week that we want to come to his house and worship him and praise him and love him? You know, what do they see? Have you ever heard anybody say, do as I say and not as I do? Tell our kids that. Do as I say and not as I do. And then you catch them later doing something that they've seen their dad or mom do. Because they watch for you. They're going to be an example of you. And you can tell them not to do it. But if you're doing it, they're going to do it too, pretty much. Our children watch us and they learn from us. Verse 5 said, our actions will affect not just the next generation, but the third and fourth generation. What is our legacy we're going to leave behind? When we die, what are we going to leave our loved ones? A home and cars that decay? Money that can be lost overnight? I don't know how many of you remember when the stock markets fell so quickly about 10 or 15 years ago. But the love and knowledge of God, if they see that in us, if we can teach that to them, that's something that we can leave them after we're gone that will never, never go away and it can't be taken from them. If you can instill the love of God in your child or your grandchild, that's going to be something that's going to stay with them way after we're dead and gone because it will live out through them. That's a legacy I want to leave with my children and my grandchildren. Verse 6 said, if we love him, and keep his commandments, he's going to show us mercy. He was telling them, it said, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. A lot of us stop there. Oh, I love God. I love the Lord. Oh, I love the Lord with all my heart. And we forget the last half of that. And keep my commandments. Oh, you mean i got to do what God tells me to? i got to read my Bible and learn about him so I know what he wants and what he doesn't want, what he likes and what he doesn't like. wonder how many times our kids or grandkids or a family member was protected because of our prayers as a Christian. And I do believe in intercessory prayer. With all my heart, I believe in intercessory prayer. So maybe my child that's not saved might have been saved from that pile up on the road because of mama's prayers. We have to put God first. If you're a Christian, you have to put God first. Turn over to Matthew chapter 22. <coughs> Matthew chapter 22. Start in verse 36. Matthew 22 and 36. Now this is a Pharisee came up. And he said, talking to Jesus, he called him master, which just means teacher. Master, which is the greatest, the great commandment in the law. Now he was trying to trick Jesus and 
If you want to know more about it, read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. There are so many wonderful stories in there. Read them for yourself. But anyway, he came up and he said, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. It didn't say love me when you feel like it. Love me when you're in trouble. Love me when you want something or have a need. We're supposed to love him all the time. It said love God with everything that we have and everything that we are. We're to love God with every part of our being. And if you do that, that person's got to come first in your life. And sometimes we get that mixed up with our children and our mates. Hey, I'm going to tell you, I love my kids with all my heart. And I love my grandkids with more than all my heart. They just somehow, have, you just love them more. And I would die for any of them in a heartbeat. Do you know how many times I've had a sick child or grandchild and I have prayed, Lord, let me be sick and let them feel better. And I'm sure every mother has prayed that prayer. Give it to me and take it off of them. But as much as I love them, God has to come first. He has to. There is no debate about it. There is no argument about it. There is no, well, if I beg long enough, I can love them more. You have to put God first above everything and everybody and believe me sometimes that's hard but we have to if we want to make it to heaven the first commandment the first commandment and it was first because it was the most important one to god that he be first in everything it said and great and a great commandment God wants to be first in our lives so much that he tells us that all through the Bible. We're to put him first. If we can't get that part right, then how can we really do any of the others any good? Because if I don't put God first, I'm going to be miserable. Things are not going to work out like I want. Things aren't going to happen like I think they should. And if God's not first, I'm not going to be able to accept the fact that it's not going to go my way. Turn over to John chapter 3 and verse 30. I guess the question to ask is if we can't put God first, how are we going to make it to heaven? I mean, really. Turn over to John chapter 3 and verse 30. This is John the Baptist talking, and we know he went out and he witnessed about God, Jesus coming. He, he told people, he taught, he preached, he baptized. But then here in verse 30, he says, he, talking about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. Think about that for a minute. Jesus must increase. And I must decrease. Now, everyone knew that John was a great man. And he was, you know. But the message wasn't about John. The message was about Jesus and salvation. John wasn't out preaching about John. John was preaching about Jesus Christ and the coming of the Messiah that was going to come and save the world. And I'm paraphrasing. I don't know about you, but before I got saved, my life was about me and what I wanted. Hopefully after we get saved, that changes. You know, it's about my dreams, mm -hmm. my expectations. Yes, sir. What I wanted, my goals in my life. About me, 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 me. I think there was a song about that. It's all about me or something. Before we get saved, that's what it is. 
I want this, I want that, I want to do this, I want to do that. It was all about what I wanted. And then I met you. <coughs> then somehow, something in me changed. It wasn't about me anymore. He increased and I decreased. My wants, my expectations, my plans, they weren't so important anymore. Because God had a plan for me. God had expectations for me. God had something he wanted me to do. So it wasn't about me anymore. It was about what God wanted for me. And that's a big difference in our life, you know. My goals in my life, they all changed into one goal. And that was to make heaven my home when I die. That was to please my Lord. We say we love God. Oh, I love him. He's so wonderful. He's so good to me. He blesses me. But do we actually want what he wants for us? Because I'm going to tell you something. When he wanted me to teach a Sunday school class, the adult Sunday school class, because I started in the nursery. I mean, I probably taught every class there can be. Nursery, toddlers, teenagers, oh, what? But when he wanted me to teach the adult Sunday school class, I'm like, uh-uh, can't do that. Who was I trusting? It wasn't God. Because if God asked me to do it, he's going to make sure that I'm equipped to do it. He's going to work through me. See, that's where I think I got mixed up. I can't do that. God, you know, I can't do that. Sister Billy Jo, Sister Allen, they've been serving the Lord longer than I have. There's people in the church that know more about the Bible. I can't do that. And finally, um, God said, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to let me do it through you. And there's a big difference. And when I realized that, and then I submitted to God's will and quit arguing about it. I was a happier person. See, sometimes we forget who we're doing it for. We're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for God. And I remember one time when Tab and, and Michael and Larry, we went to this church. Three people showed up that belonged in the church. And I think we might have had four or five of our own people went with us. Larry said, what are we going to do? There's only three people here. I looked at him and I said, you're not doing it for the people here. You're doing it for God. I said, you're going to sing like there's a hundred people sitting out there. And we had the best service you just would not imagine. See, we're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for God, which he is supposed to come first in our life. And when he does, it doesn't matter. Well, Brother Edward and after COVID, I told that story. It was me, Larry, and Brother Edward and Sister Janet. I told Larry, I said, I gotta teach Sunday school class. That's my calling. And we've been closed because of COVID for so long. If you're not, and, and I miss church sometimes. Sometimes a legitimate reason and sometimes not. I'll just be honest. But when you start missing a lot, you have a longing in your heart that part of you is missing. You want to be in church to worship God. So where is God in our life? Is he first? You know, my goals in life, like I said, they all changed into one goal, and that was to make heaven my home when I died. My dreams became a desire to see my loved ones saved. But even more than that, to see strangers saved. You know, it's easy to pray for our kids and our grandkids, our loved ones. But what about the people two houses down that you know they don't go to church? Sometimes their music is loud and they're partying. Do we pray for them? Because as a Christian, we don't get to pick and choose who we pray for. We don't get to pick and choose who we witness to. So let me rephrase that. 
We do sometimes pick and choose, but we're not supposed to pick and choose. God will send people through your life. Brother Jason, it don't do me any good to witness to you about God's love because you already know about it. But that person standing out on the street corner doesn't. And if God wants you to go out and talk to that person and witness to that person, he's already been working on them. He's already been tugging at their heart. And it may just be you handing them a McDonald's meal saying, God just told me to give you this and tell you that he loves you and walk off. You've done what God wants you to do. We have to put God first. It's not about what we want anymore. It's about what God wants. He must increase and we must decrease. And if we can get that, my expectations, they disappeared when I started trusting God to take care of me. Because you know what? He only wants good things for me. He wants the best for me. And my life has been so much better since I have let him into it than it ever was before I did. Turn over to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8 and 28. And we hear this recited a lot. Well, half of it. You know, a lot of Christians are half-verse people. They'll quote half verse. They don't quote the whole verse. They just quote half. And that's another reason to read it for yourself. Just because somebody's been in church all their life and they, money's the root of all evil. We've all heard that. Money's the root of all evil. Half verse. Half verse. The love of money is the root of all evil. But we hear money is the root of all evil our whole entire life, but we think that's, a, that's the whole verse. Don't take somebody else's word. Read it for yourself. Learn the scripture. Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. And we quit there. Half verse. It said, To them who are the called according to his purpose. God will take care of us. He will give us good things, but we have to put him first. We have to do what he asked us to do. You know, how many of us would stay home all week and show up on Friday and say, I want my paycheck? <laughs> give me my paycheck. You hired me. So what that I didn't work any this week? Give me my paycheck. I'd probably have a pink slip waiting on me is what I'd probably have. And yet sometimes that's what we expect from God. God, I gave my heart to you. I gave my life to you. I sit on that pew every Sunday, every Sunday night. Give me my blessing. Solve this problem. Meet this need. And we never open our Bible. The only time we talk to him is when we want. Gimme, gimme, gimme. And we never take time to put him first. So if we don't do our part, why should he do his? You know, if I came to you and said, hey, make me a cake, I'll pay you $20. Mow my yard, I'll give you 30 And you showed up with no cake or no lawnmower and said, pay me. I'm going to kind of look at you and say, well, there was kind of a two-way thing here. You're supposed to do this, and then I come through with my part. And if you're not going to do your part, then I'm going to get somebody else to do it and pay them, and you're out of luck. And yet sometimes that's the attitude we take with God. God, I know you're up there. I know you're real. I got saved 50 years ago, and I've been sitting here now. You just blessed me. It doesn't work that way. God has to come first in our lives in everything. The verses above, well, to what? Turn over to Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. It says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
So first, we have to seek the kingdom of God. We have to put him first. And his righteousness. So I can't just get saved and then be the same person that I've always been. For one thing, I don't know if you really got saved. Because if you get saved, you're going to want to live for God. You're going to want to stop some of the things that you've done. May take longer on some things than others. Seek his righteousness. Well, how do you know what that is? How do we know what God's righteousness is? Well, like I said, read it for yourself. Find out what it is. This is, we know it's the holy word of God, the true word of God. But to me, it's more than that. It's like a personal journal from God himself. He wrote this or had men inspired to write this to me. So that when I got saved, thousands of years later than it was written, I could go back and say, hey, look at this. Look where he made the earth. Look where he made the animals. Look where he created man. He made all that other stuff. He created man. Look at how he delivered his people from bondage. Look at how he loved them and took care of them. There's stories all through the Bible where God multiplied would not uh, he would multiply stock, cattle, sheep. He would provide for them. He provided for them in the wilderness. There's all sorts of stories in here. And if he did it for them, he'll do it for me. But you've got to read it for yourself. Get in there and find out what God will do for you. Get in there and find out what God expects from you. Get in there and find out his expectations for you, his dreams for you. There's so many scriptures about that in the Bible. But you got to read it. And I think I said this last week. There's scripture in there, and I can't quote scripture word for word, but there's scripture about having it on the tablets of our heart. How can we have it in our heart or even in our mind if we never read it? And if you believe everything that everybody said, did you know that people know the Bible that aren't saved? Quote it, they can quote it, quote it, quote it. Sometimes they quote it right and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they quote it to their advantage. But we, as Christians, think, well, if they know the Bible, then they must be godly. Satan knew the Bible. Satan knew the word. Satan had been with God. And he was not godly. So don't take the word of everybody just because it sounds good. Read it for yourself. Learn it. Learn why God wants you to put him first. You know, he's our God. Here's my last scripture. And this is something for you to think about. Turn over to Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. Matthew 19, verse 29. And if anything says something about putting God first, this would be it. It says that everyone that had forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Now think about that. Think about it. He's saying that sometimes we're going to have to give up something that is so important to us 
that we just can't, in our human mind, comprehend us doing that. And this was Jesus talking himself. This is him telling us that sometimes we're going to have to give up something we like. Something we love. And when I say give up, I don't mean he's telling us to give up our kids or our grandkids or our mates. He's saying that we're going to have to give up their position. You know, this doesn't mean that we have to hate them or disown them or anything. But sometimes we may have to keep a distance from them. Our friends that we partied with when we get saved, we may have to distance from them. We may have to get new friends, get a new family. When I was talking to somebody the other day about family, our church family, and how important they are to us. You know, so it's saying that they're going to have to come second or third, like lower than what God is. Because God has to be first. No matter what place our family, our friends, our job, our hobbies take, God always has to come first. And if you want to make it to heaven, you'll have to be first. Then love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and all your strength. But then it's your choice. Your choice where you place God in your life, you know. But remember, it's not just you that it's going to affect. It's going to affect the third and fourth generation. So what will we leave behind for our children? Will it be blessings or will it be curses? Look at your life this week. See what you think about the most. Think about what's important to you. Think about where God comes into that. What position does he hold? Because if he's not first, then we need to change our priorities. Because if you want to make it to heaven, he's got to be first in your life.